In a concert back in March of this year with the Spokane British Brass Band, I had the unexpected treat of getting to play solos on a couple of our pieces. I made sure to take videos of those and I just recently posted them. If you haven't seen them, you can find them up in the top right corner in the card. But the purpose of today's video is to just take a minute to reflect and talk about the experience as it was a really fun one. Stay tuned. Just a little tidbit if you're new to or unfamiliar with the British brass band tradition, the cornet section is the largest section in most brass bands, and they are positioned to the audience's left, split over two rows because there are so many of them. Generally, there are four players that make up the front row cornets, and they're referred to as the solo cornets. Think of them as the first cornets, because fittingly enough, the people who sit behind them are the second and third cornets. Calling the part whatever you wish, the solo cornet part in the band tends to have, fittingly, a lot of melodic material and sometimes solos in a fair amount of the pieces. And when the solo cornets are handed their solo cornet parts, it's kind of on them to figure out how that material is distributed. Some particularly brave or maybe egotistical first chair cornetists will try and take on all the solos, or perhaps some of the more wise among them will try and split it with the co-principal so that they're pacing themselves appropriately. But you might also end up in a band, as is the case for the Spokane Brass Band, where there's actually a very nice egalitarian sort of system across the solo row where everybody gets featured at different times. I think in this particular concert we had a little something for everybody. The first piece on that concert set to which I was sort of given the reins was the famous Pavan by Gabriel Fauré. It's a very well-known and beautiful piece of music, and this arrangement had lots of great lyrical cornet solos which I love to do. But that was not the only reason that this piece was significant to me. Actually, the previous season, the 21-22 season, we were sort of cut short due to COVID difficulties. We could only perform one concert in May at the very end of the season, or what would be the end if I suppose if we'd had multiple concerts. But that season, once again, was my first, and I was put in the second cornet section in the back row, and that's where I spent most of my time. But I was actually allowed to bring up the rear of the solo section in fourth chair for a few of the pieces. And in fact, on one of those pieces, the conductor decided, hey, let's put this guy through his paces, and he gave me some solos to work on. And you know what it was? It was the Maurice Ravel Pavan. And I'm not terribly much of a believer in fate, per se, but it almost did feel like fate that two seasons in a row, my sort of feature piece, if you will, was a very beautiful Pavan. The other piece I wanted to talk about today was probably my favorite from the concert set, although I definitely didn't expect it to be at the time. It's called the Ritual Fire Dance, and it's a traditional Spanish song that is just infectiously fun to play, and as you might expect, it has some fairly fiery melodies throughout the band. It's a very, very fun piece. Again, I strongly recommend listening if you haven't already, and once again, you know where to go for that. But there was some interesting writing in the solo cornet part that culminated in the band featuring the third and fourth chair solo cornets, that is myself and my buddy Jay, who is a lot of fun to play with. We got to do some duet stuff between the two of us in this piece, and I got to do a little bit of solo stuff. The opening statement in the solo cornet part was marked A2, or two players only, and this is pretty common. It tends to just mean, hey, principal, co-principal, you two play, third and fourth chair, you sit out until further notice. And further notice in this case was a couple of measures of backgrounds from the other two players until the four players play tutti or unison. But what was interesting was those backgrounds that the other two were supposed to play were higher in register than that A2 melody statement. And one possible interpretation of this is, well, it's a higher register part, it should go to the higher chair players. So the principal and co-principal actually sit out while that opening statement is going on, and then they play the higher backgrounds before the two. That's not a conclusive end-all be-all sort of interpretation. There are recordings out there where the first two chairs are doing that opening statement, even though it's lower in register. So that alone didn't necessarily inform our decision. But there was another thing later on. There was a section of the piece that involved some octave splits, which are fairly common in solo cornet parts, and as the third chair, I'm used to playing the bottom octave of these splits. Generally, it's if you have two octaves, your top two players play the top, your bottom two players play the bottom. Unsurprisingly, right? And then in between these octave sections, there were little solo sections sprinkled in where one player was to prepare a mute and then stick it in for the solos. We were all playing those octave splits and I was playing the bottom, and then our second chair player next to me noticed something. He noticed that the octave splits were actually only marked to have three players, and that was to give the other player time to actually keep the mute in the bell rather than keep alternating in a very foolish manner. But what was interesting and unusual about it was that of the three players, Two of them were supposed to play the top octave split, and only one on the bottom, even though the E-flat cornet behind us was playing that same top octave as well. That's extremely unusual, especially if you have the E-flat cornet playing the same line. You would want two of your B-flats on the lower line and only one up top. But the fact that only one player was supposed to be on the bottom octave in between those solo segments kind of suggested that maybe the third or fourth chair was supposed to be the one taking those muted solos, and that's what the second chair said to me. 
I asked Jay if he wanted them since he was the other candidate in the running, I suppose, and Jay was indifferent towards it, so it ended up being me. And so I got to play some strange little muted segments in between. I don't know if I'd necessarily call them solos, but they were one player only, and uh, the conductor kept telling me to play out during those sections, so we'll call them solos, I suppose. They were fun, in any case. Anyway, here's hoping Editor Sam can cut down some of that rambling, but that was a quick, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully quick. I don't think I've ever managed to make a quick video, but that was a reflection, if you will, on our March 2023 concert in the Spokane British Brass Band, where I got to play a couple of solos. Once again, a really fun experience. If you enjoyed this video and you wanna see more story time type stuff, make sure to leave a like and a comment down below. And until next time, we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here, and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.